Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So Anne Teresa Fredrickson. Fredrickson is an assistant professor in communication arts, sciences, and disorders at Brooklyn College CUNY. Prior to coming to Brooklyn College in 2022, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Irvine. And before that, she earned her PhD in linguistics and cognitive science from the University of California, San Diego in 2019. Dr. Fredrickson's research focuses on sign language processing and bilingualism and has been funded by the National Science Foundation, dissertation and postdoctoral. Dr. Fredrickson is a member of the Roll Collective, a diverse group of language scientists working towards challenging the indiscriminate reliance on nativeness in language science, language assessments, and more broadly in academia and society, which we are really lucky to hear about some of that work today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fredrickson. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be invited to talk to you all. And I already met some people in the audience and had some good conversations. So thank you for that. Um, and um, looking forward to hearing the questions that you have in the Q&A session. So um, I'm going to talk to you about something that I'm, you know, I'm working on in my own work and how I'm thinking about my own work. And so what that looks like in the current state is uh, this talk, what good is a native norm, when it mostly doesn't apply, assessing the consequences of language deprivation on narratives in American Sign Language. So if you are a language scientist, and you probably are in some capacity if you're in this room right now, you're probably very familiar with the term native speaker because it's something we rely on all the time. Or if you're into sign language, native signer, um, that's something that we're brought up to rely on to take for granted and to use uh, whenever we're thinking about language reading. Um, but that sort of implicit understanding comes with a flip side, which is that we don't actually usually define what we mean when we say native speaker or signer. So for most of us, if we were pressed to say what we mean, we probably mean something like a native user of language X, Y, Z is somebody who has learned that language from birth. That's probably what most of us would think. So intuitively, this is what we mean when we say the word. The thing is that it doesn't always apply. And even in the places where it does apply, it doesn't capture everybody that we actually meant to include when we use that label. So if we're thinking about people like heritage language users, so those would be people who learn a given language in their home, for example, most typically, they learn a language in the home. And then when they start school, they learn another language. So this could be a typical case in the US where it's Spanish in the home and then uh, going to school, you learn English and you become very, very proficient in using English. And actually you become better and more comfortable in English than you are in Spanish. And if we measure these people on some of the things that we measure other people on, we'll find that they don't look like the people that we usually think of as native speakers. In some ways they don't, in other ways they do. But it's sort of, from this categorization, they should fall under native speakers. But in some of their language behaviors, they don't actually look like native speakers. So that's a potential problem for this idea of who's a native user. We also know about bilinguals in general, that as soon as you become bilingual, almost regardless of your proficiency, you don't look like a monolingual in different things anymore. So when we say this, do we also mean monolingual? Or are we OK with including the variation that comes with bilingualism in different things? What about uses of languages that are revitalized? So they may be learning the language from birth, but only in small portions, uh, because that language isn't being spoken so much in the community, they're working on building it up. Are those speakers, native, native speakers of that language that's being revitalized? And then a real problematic place is that lots and lots of people who are actually fitting this perfectly, they're native users of whatever language we're talking about, but perhaps their skin color isn't what we're associating with the typical language user of that language, or perhaps they have a disability that makes us think that their language isn't actually what we mean when we say native language, um, or it could be that they're actually um, speakers of a different variety of that language. So say if we're talking about English, what about somebody who speaks Indian English and has done so from birth? Are we going to think are they the same as a person who speaks American English or British English? And in what ways are we including and excluding people? So as uh, 
Or mentioned in the, uh, the introduction here, um, I'm part of this group called the Role Collective, which I put a, a little information over there if anybody's interested. Um, we're a group of people that are interested in sort of challenging how we think about what it means to be a native speaker and whether it's a helpful thing to talk about in language research. Um, because it turns out that, as I've already sort of alluded to, the idea of a native speaker is sort of intertwined with all of these things, way race and ethnicity, with gender and people's nationality and the different types of disabilities that people can have. So we're a really diverse group of people. At different, there's undergraduate students and graduate students and um, full tenure professors and everybody in between working on different parts of language. Um, and if you're interested, uh, we're always open to new, uh, to new members. Come contribute as much as you want or, or don't want or have a look. Um, it's a really open community. Did I mention what it's called? It's called the World Collective. It stands for Reframing Our Language Experience. All right. So I came to the, this question of nativeness through my work on uh, sign language, also bilingualism, but mostly through the, the sign language part, which is what I'll focus on today. So I probably don't have to say this to this audience, but I'll do it just to highlight that this is something that not everybody knows. When we're talking about sign language. Not everybody is aware that sign languages, first of all, are real natural languages, that there are more of them, that they're not all the same, not all deaf people use the same sign language if they're signers. And also the fact that these, because these are natural languages, they came about in the same way that spoken languages probably do. We don't have the same easy way of measuring that. Um, but at least that's what we think through communities sort of converging on language forms and vocabulary and how you should say things um, when you mean a certain thing, um, sort of everybody agreeing on what it is that our language is. Um, and because sign languages did that, that's why we also have different sign languages and they're not the same, even though wouldn't it be easier if all the signers spoke the same sign language. Um, so, I'm struggling with my cursor. All right, but if sign languages then are natural, typical, normal languages, then we should be thinking about finding out who's a native signer the same way that we're thinking about who's a native speaker. So what we might expect, expect is that then all the problems that I just mentioned should also apply to figuring out who's a native, uh, native signer, not just a native speaker. Um, that's true, I think, but it turns out that for the signing community, we have to look at some additional complications when we're thinking about who's a native signer. So that particular complication is that when we're looking at the deaf community, it's only somewhere between five and 10% of people who are deaf, deaf children. That small proportion, five to 10% have deaf parents, which means that those are the people in the position to learn their language from birth. For the other deaf children, they are born through hearing families. And so their parents don't know sign language, which means that they don't have immediate access to language, those children, because they are deaf and the parents don't know sign language. In addition, when we're talking about sign languages, another complication is that sign languages don't in and of themselves have a, have a written form, or at least nobody has found a system that everybody can agree on yet. So that means that when you're a deaf signer and you have to learn to read and write, which you have to do because you have to go to school, and most of the time you have to go to school in a school that's focused on the spoken language of your community, um, you have to learn to read and write in that community spoken language, right? Which means that almost everybody who's gone to school and is a deaf signer also has learned English, at least in the written form. And I'm talking about American Sign Language here, not every sign language. Um, and then of course, all the same confounds as we, as we have in identifying who's a native signer uh, that we talked about for this, the hearing communities with the spoken languages, those same things apply effects of race and ethnicity are all affecting who we think is a good model of a native site. So what does that mean? What, what should we do? Given that there's just such a small proportion of reasonably considered uh, to be native signers, should we just abandon this idea altogether since what are we really describing if we're just talking about 5% of the potential population? Is it really a good way of talking about a language as a whole? Um, maybe, 
I think I think we shouldn't just do that yet. And the reason for that is I think it's important that we have some kind of a benchmark for performance for what it needs to be a really fluent, competent, skilled signer. And the reason for that is the real risk of language deprivation that exists um, in the deaf community for deaf people. Um, as we talked about before, if there's about 5% of deaf children that are born into deaf families, that means that the remaining 95%, 90%, however, uh, whatever, this is a little bit unclear, but the vast majority of deaf children are going to have hearing pains, right? So in that case, how do those kids access language? That depends. But for the most part, the medical community, their approach has been to um, think that we must teach speech first. How are deaf children going to have access to speech? Well, we have this invention. Invention, is that the word? Intervention? Invention called cochlear implants, which, which is a, an implant that you can have implanted um, with surgery. And it's sort of, it doesn't restore your hearing, but it provides uh, some way of getting audible signals to the brain. The problem with cochlear implants is that they don't actually restore hearing. So we have variable success rates for implants. So for some people, they work well, and for other people, they don't. In most cases, either way, it requires extensive therapy and intervention from speech language pathologists and audiologists. But what is talked less about is that even for those for whom this approach, speech first, is successful, even those that are treated as the good cases, the successful cases, sometimes they fall one to two standard deviations below the mean of what the average person otherwise does um, who doesn't have a hearing impairment, which means that even when in the good cases, they're not performing language as well as they possibly could have if they had had full access to language. And then when we think about those who fail, that is those who start out with a cochlear implant and they're having uh, a speech only approach, attempts are made at teaching them speech at getting them to use the implant at getting the implant to work, all of those things. And yet at some point they fail, meaning they can't do it. They're not acquiring speech. They're not being successful. For those people, they've wasted really important years of their language learning journey. You can imagine what happens if you actually haven't got spoken language by the age of two, three, four, five, six. Um, those are really, really valuable years for learning your first language in this case which means that that's a scenario that we should really, really want to avoid. Why should we want to avoid that scenario? Well, because when you have a situation where somebody doesn't learn a first language to start with in the first important years of their life, this leads to language deprivation. And what the research on language deprivation, late language learning, late first language learning has shown is that even though there are things that can still be learned, even after those initial years, we've seen uh, lexical development when uh, deaf people who haven't had access to language, when they initially start learning, their lexical development actually looks fairly similar to that of children learning language for the first time. So you see this initial development in their MLU, their mean length of utterance, um, that looks sort of like children pretty much, and it's going well. They're actually learning quite rapidly in the first um, the first months and years, and then they plateau. Then they get stuck. We also see that some morphology can be mastered. So some bits of verb agreement, some elements of syntax um, can be learned even when you start late, but it tends to be really basic. In addition, uh, brain imaging research has shown that when language learning starts late for the first time, you get different neurological patterns, sometimes different uh, brain structures or brain pathways. And then uh, you also get pervasive problems with morphosyntax. So anything beyond the most basic seems to cause extreme problems and uh, comprehension, both for comprehension and production um, for morphosyntax. And what's really disturbing is that what we see is on the one hand that the later you start, the worse your outcomes are going to be. And this cannot be mitigated 
by length of experience. Meaning, if you start late learning language, it doesn't matter how many years of language you are working with later, you are not going to improve beyond a certain point. That's what the research is suggesting, which is, is really, really unfortunate and scary and means that we want to not have anybody be deprived of language if at all we can help it. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that takes um, the research on language deprivation uh, to a different realm than has typically been studied. So we know a fair amount of about vocabulary acquisition and about more syntax. Um, what we know less about is uh, what happens when you go beyond the sentence level. So what happens when you have to use your language to tell a story and make connections between clauses and texts? So narratives, which is what I'm studying here, is um, to tell a narrative, you of course have to use language to express how you're conceptualizing something, right? So in the studies that I do, people typically watch a story, either a um, made up drawings or a little video, and then they tell it to somebody else. Right? So they have to use language to express you know, what they got in their minds as they were watching the story, and then it has to come out again using language. But not only that, they also have to structure that stuff that they saw in some kind of coherent way. You have to structure a story so that the adversary understands that it's a story that has a beginning and something happening in the middle, middle and an end. Right? Sometimes we split this up into things like the setting, the complication of resolution, or, or an evaluation. So um, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is a study that looked at narratives from five deaf adults who learned language after early childhood. So the other reason why narratives, uh, is not just a story structure that makes narratives um, interesting and um, interesting because it's a sort of challenging way of using language, the other thing that I'm particularly interested in is called reference setting. And that's the idea of how do you tell the addressee that you're talking about the same entity or a different entity across different clauses, right? So those of you who've ever heard a preschooler tell a story will know what I'm talking about because they launch right into the story and then they say things, things like, and then he went to the store and then he got to milk and then he, but then he, and then he, and you don't know who they're talking about, right? Because they keep referring to the same thing and different things using the same type of expression when really what they needed to do was say, and then the man did this and then the other man, but then he, and then the first man, right? So keeping track of who it is that you're talking about. Um, the way to typically do this is possibly represented by something like this figure in which reference accessibility is shown here on the x-axis. So the lower the accessibility is of the reference, meaning the less your addressee is likely to understand immediately who you're talking about or the longer time you've been not talking about that thing, the more you need to make it explicit, meaning you have to use something like a full noun phrase to refer to that thing. So if the man has not been talked about for a bit, you have to call him the man instead of he, which you would use something like a pronoun at much higher reference accessibility levels. So if you're telling a story in English, for example, this is the type of story that I'm typically using, a very, very, very simple story. It could look something like this. Well, there's a boy and he goes into a park where he sees a balloon man, and he walks over to the balloon man and points out a nice balloon. That might be the beginning of, um, of a story of the type that I'm doing. And what we'll see in this example is that the first mention of whoever we're talking about here, the boy, uses the full noun phrase, a boy, rather than something like he, so that we know that there's a boy that's being talked about. The next mention, we have a he, which is appropriate because we don't keep saying there's a boy and then a boy goes into a park. That would be awkward. So we don't do that. We use something that's that's um, less material and less explicit. And then the first mention of the balloon man again has to be explicit. And the balloon man keeps being explicit just because uh, the he that's being talked about here is still referring to the boy. And then sometimes in English, not so much, um, but in other languages, much more. We can even have a zero mention, a, a, a total pronoun drop or some other reference drop when it's absolutely clear what you're talking about. You can talk about the follow up. Okay, so I'm studying this in American Sign Language ASL. Uh, 
And um, the same principles apply. We know this from prior research. The same principles apply as I just talked about, where you have to be more explicit in the beginning, and then as it becomes more familiar, you can use less marking material to talk about the people that you're talking So I'm going to show you an example of what uh, a story like this. Is it the balloon man? I'm not sure if this is a pop. Oh, this is a popsicle story. So same same difference. Somebody um, sees a popsicle seller, gets a popsicle, walks away, drops a popsicle, and is on the stand of the So that's what he's going to talk about now. I'm going to show it once at normal speed and then once or twice in slow motion, depending on what we need. Okay, so here we go. All right, so very, very short and simple stories that you could see. I'm gonna show it this time in slow motion so that you can pick up the captions. Oh, I don't know what's going on. All right, so this is what telling a short, simple story would look like in ASL. And this is a person who's been signing ASL from this. So a very fluent, very competent, uh, simple version of the story. So in ASL, when we're looking at reference tracking, we're seeing much the same as we might see in English, just looking a little bit different because of A modality and B different language. So what we see is that nouns are used frequently. So we saw this when he was signing boy. Uh, we also get a lot of zero and aphora, meaning those things where you don't actually say explicit who it is, explicitly who it is, it's understood from the context or uh, from the syntax or from the uh, pragmatics. But in ASL, those things can come from different from different things. So you can have zero and aphora that come from verbs, meaning you don't explicitly say who's the subject, sometimes also the object of the verb. But they can also come from constructed action. Constructed action is this phenomenon that um, if you're a signer, you will have seen it a lot. If you're not, it's essentially taking on the role of the person you're talking about and using your body as if it's the person that you're talking about's body. So if I'm um, if I'm the boy seeing the balloon man, I may take on the role of the boy and I might point excitedly, and that would be a sort of example of using that constructed action. I'm using my body, the signers using their body as if they are the uh, entity in question. You can label construction actions. So you could say boy and then do as the boy did, or you can not do that. And that will be a case of a zero and aphra that came from constructed action. We can also get zero and aphra from classifiers, although um, I tend to think that they're a little bit different, but that's not for today. Classifiers are these things that um, they're ty a type of verb, mostly. They can also be uh, noun like or adjective like. But um, the ones I'm focused on are from verbs. So there are things like using a sign like this to mean upright person typically is moving forward, right? So you can use this in different ways. It can go well, this way instead or towards you. Um, it's essentially where there's a relationship and classifiers uh, between the shape of your, your handshake and the thing that it's expressing. Right? So if it's a person, you would have something like this. You could also have a vehicle that would be something like this. Um, and these things can also occur either with a label. Typically, you have to use a noun first before you use a classifier to talk about the same thing. Um, but when you've done that once, you can keep using them without explicitly mentioning who it is who is doing the action um, represented in the classifier. Okay. So... As I mentioned, I'm interested in narratives because of the way that they require you to use language. And there are these two components. There's a, how you structure, structure the story and then how you talk about the entities in the story. And both of these are, are difficult in their own way. So what we know from prior work is that children are not good at either of these things initially. Even after children are capable of doing the things that you would think go into this, even after children are able to use pronouns and nouns and zero and aphra and all this stuff, they can't usually use them in the right way when they're telling a story. They tend to 
get things mixed up anyway. Um, and the same thing for story structure. So what we see here in this um, in this table from uh, work by Gary Morgan a long time ago now, um, he essentially measured how many episodes in a story do children of different ages include. And when you look at the at the end of that table, see it also included nineteen um, story episodes on average. The youngest child group included five point five episodes. So if the adults mention all of the episodes, then the children are mentioning, you know, almost only a quarter of them. Uh, the seven to ten year olds, they get more episodes in. But even the 11 to 13 year olds don't get as many in as the adults do, right? So it's very clear that even just how much information you include, how many episodes, how many um, scenes you talk about, that's something that has to develop over time. The other thing is once you've got your story structure or some part of it, how do you talk about the people who are making up the action in your story? Um, and what we see here in, in this graph is, um, how, how the different groups uh, saying as we have here, how they talk about the entities in the story. So, um, uh, uh, so this uh, graph here is showing us how many full noun phrases were used to either introduce an entity into the story, so mentioning them for the first time, uh, maintain the entity meaning, Right after you introduced it, you kept talking about it. And how did you do that? And then reintroduction means after it was absent from the discourse for a little bit, it came back in, but it was already known from the beginning. And what we see if we look at this is that uh, for the introduction, what you'd expect is that we shouldn't have a lot of noun phrases. That's when you mostly need a noun phrase because you need to be explicit about what's going, what's going on. The adults almost use 100% noun phrases to introduce an entity, but children use uh, much less. Right, which means that they do something else um, that is less appropriate in these contexts. Um, so it's clear that this has a prolonged developmental trajectory. It takes a while in language acquisition to get to the point where you're actually using um, all that you know about language well in telling a narrative. So what should we then expect when language is learned late and you have to tell a narrative under those conditions, what we already know is that these people who learn language late can typically master the basic grammar of their language. And so maybe they should be able to do certain things, right? But children also do that, and children aren't able to do all the things that you have to do in the narrative. On the other hand, many of these people that we're, um, that we're looking at when they are learning language late Let's say you started learning your first language when you were eight, and we test you five years later. You essentially have the language experience of a five-year-old. You've learned your language for five years. But you are already, in terms of your life experience, you're an adolescent. Maybe you can harness that life experience to sort of help your pragmatic abilities. Maybe you have a better awareness of what is it the adversary needs to know from me, which is part of what is making uh, narratives from children so hard to understand is that they don't have an awareness of what the adversary needs to know from them. And actually, some previous research has suggested that for people who are learning language after the immediate early childhood, the narrative domain is maybe resilient to these age of acquisition effects that are all otherwise present um, across the board in other linguistic domains. Um, so I have a graph over there on the side. Let me just put some things up. Um, this is from Gur and Streamer's research in 2022. And what they did is they, um, they measured uh, native signing children, native signing adults, late signing children, late learners, and late people who are late learners as children, but then when they were adults. Um, and they statistically, they found no difference, yes, between, between children and adults, but they didn't find any uh, effect of learning language late. And that's how they concluded that perhaps this domain is resilient to these age transition effects. Um, to me, when I look at this graph, what jumps out at me so clearly is uh, the difference over here between the native child and the late learner child. Um, that there's a difference here in how often they use lexical signs, meaning noun phrases, to uh, introduce entities. 
we have uh, the native signing children well over 60% and uh, the late learning children over 40%. So even though statistically there's no difference, uh, the means come out as actually quite different. And correspondingly, we have using constructed action that is taking on that role of the entity from the story on your own body. That's used a lot by late signing children to introduce entities, which is not appropriate. It's also used by um, by native signing children, but less so. Yet, no statistical effects here. So the conclusion has to be for now from this study that perhaps this domain is missing. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about a study that I did with uh, my PhD advisor Rachel Mayberry where we look at uh, signers who were much later learners of the first language than the people that we just saw. So as I mentioned, we, um, we looked at five deaf participants. We're using pseudonyms to refer to them. So it's Cody, Carl, Shauna, Martin, and Maya. And they were all at the time of testing, they were adults. They were between 21 and 59 years of age. Their age of acquisition ranged from 14 years to 20 years old, meaning that is when they first start, started learning ASL as their first language. As far as we can tell from interviewing them, from interviewing people who know them, uh, they didn't have any other language before. Uh, one person perhaps had a little bit of home sign, but, um, but nothing that would be considered an actual language, not even close. So by the time we tested them, They've been learning ASL, signing ASL for uh, different ranges of time. So uh, the person who had the shortest time had been signing for eight years, and the person the longest had been signing for 43 years. Um, and they were all, uh, except for one profoundly deaf, one was had moderate to severe deafness. Um, but none of them had any spoken language uh, production abilities. All right. So uh, the method that we used to test these uh, late learners narratives was we used these short, simple stories that I talked about. So we essentially had seven scenes or seven episodes that we included in um, four different stories. So there was a scene setting, there's a person, there was a meeting. So they come up to some kind of seller of something, popsicle seller, balloon seller. Then uh, there's an exchange of the object in question, popsicle, balloon, face. Then the person leaves with the object, loses the object, has the reaction to it, and then we see the leap. So that's the story, uh, the story structure of all these stories. And what we asked participants to do was watch the story and then tell it to a native signing, uh, uh, and, and deaf native signer who was sitting opposite you. So we then video recorded their uh, stories, how they told them, and we transcribed and annotated them. Um, and what we looked for in our annotation was which events Whenever they used a clause, which clause, uh, which um, event was that clause talking about, we coded every time they mentioned an entity, either overtly or they had um, they had dropped the overt reference. We coded whether it was the first mention, the introduction, whether they had kept talking about that thing that was the contained reference, and where, or whether they had reintroduced it after it was absent for a little while. We then also coded whenever they talked about an entity, how did they do that? So we had uh, the categories of noun, the zero and upper, and then we had classifiers. There were, we also had pronouns, but there turned out to be almost none of those. So I'll not talk about those. And then for um, for the zero and upper that came from verbs or constructed action, we also looked at spatial modulation, which is a term that um, sometimes it's called agreement, but it doesn't fully encompass things that are not verb like. So spatial modulation is this thing that you can do in many sign languages, including ASL, which is essentially you set up entities in the space in front of you. So you can imagine in the perhaps simplest form, this is, uh, I'm talking about Lisa, and I set up Lisa over here, and I'm talking about Mary, and I set up Mary over here, so that if I'm talking about Lisa giving Mary something, I can take my verb give and take it from Lisa to Mary. Now it means she gives her. Uh, that's one option for using spatial modulation. I could also say, okay, I'm putting on the role of Lisa on myself, and so I'm going to give it to Mary, but I'm still using my body to mark the space where Lisa and Mary are uh, located 
in life science space. So both of those cases would be considered spatial modulation. Either both entities are here and I'm in here, or I'm one of them and I'm so interacting in, inside the space. No spatial modulation would be, I'm essentially using citation form of a verb. So if I'm signing here, I would do it like this, where it's not clear that I've set Mary over here and it's not clear that Lisa's over here. I'm just sort of saying the, the citation form of the verb without doing anything with space. So the reason why we're interested in spatial modulation was because of this um, prior research showing that the morphosyntax is the places where the late learners um, tend to really struggle. So we wanted to make sure to include um, spatial modulation, which is essentially morphological marking in ASL. <clears throat> All right. So first I'm showing the results um, of uh, the storage structure. And this is essentially just boils down to how many Oh, sorry, there's a little bit of an issue here. Um, how many um, how many episodes, how many scenes were included of the seven ones we had divided our stories into? How many did the signers include? And I'm including in all of these results, I'm including for reference um, the average of what uh, a group of native signers did in a prior study we did using the same stimulus. Um, So what we're seeing here is essentially the, um, the five uh, late learners, and what we're seeing here is all of the different um, scenes that could possibly be included. What we're seeing is that overall, they're actually including quite a lot. So for each of these, there were four stories, so there's four. They told all four stories, including that particular scene. So for most of these signers, it's actually looking pretty good. They're including a lot of stuff, right? If we're looking at the totals down here, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, the maximum is, I can't remember, it was maybe 28. Yeah, the 20th. Um, and the native signers also didn't always include every episode. They tended to leave the meeting episode out um, if they did anything. But what I want you to focus on is that some people, ah, <laughs> this is moved up, sorry, this is supposed to be here. If we're looking at Shauna's results, what we're seeing is that she doesn't mention the scene setting, not in any story. She doesn't mention the meeting episode, not in a single story. She mentions once the fact that the person gets an object. But she also doesn't mention that they leave with the object. So all of her stories essentially start by the time the person loses the object, which is at the end of the story. So if you're the recipient, the addressee of this story, you're missing a lot of content here that's not being um, What we're also seeing is that um, just like the native scientists did, um, sometimes if things were left out, it was that initial meeting. You can work around that, so that's not really so important. But for Shauna's performance, um, you're not getting enough information to understand what the story is about. When we look at the reference tracking, um, I first want to show you the um, what the native signers did on average. This is always uh, averaged across the group. Um, what we're seeing here is the there are three panels: the introduced references, so the first mention, the maintained, the continued references, and then the reintroduced ones at the end. Um, and then this is the proportion uh, of use, and the colors show yellow for classifier, uh, blue for noun, and green for serial noun. So when we're looking at the native signs, what we're seeing for the introduced references is that they mostly use nouns, which is exactly what we'd expect. First mention, you need to tell people what you're talking about and be explicit about. It. There's a little little bit of classifier use, but it's it's quite small. When we're looking at the maintained references, what we're seeing is mostly serial noun some classifiers, very few nouns. And when we're going to the reintroduced references, we're seeing, again, mostly Syrian and Afra, but also some proportion of nouns and students. So next, we're going to look at uh, the late learners' introductions, because that is the most interesting to look at. So for the most part, if you just if you start just looking, glancing sort of half an eye, you can see that the blue bars are pretty high almost across the board, meaning that for the most part, most of the late learners actually mostly introduced with nouns. So in that respect, they sort of look like the native signers in that if they're using something, it's the most likely to be a noun. But if we look at Shauna's performance, we see that she's, she isn't doing that. Remember that she starts her stories after the person has already lost the object, right? So she doesn't do any introduction of anybody. She just starts right in the middle and she starts mostly talking about people with a serial number. So no introduction to anybody. She just 
talks about them without mentioning who they are. She also uses nouns, but it's less frequent than her use of zero and aphorism. And she also uses classifiers, again, which typically require a noun first before you use the classifier. And we see a similar pattern, although, uh, again, with the nouns being the most frequent for both Martin and Carlos. Carlos uses 25% of zero and aphorism, meaning at a quarter of his, his introductions, for the first time he talks about somebody, he doesn't say anything about them. It's a drop reference. Um, Martin uses not zero and aphorism, but again, classifiers at a fairly high proportion that we don't expect to see for reference introduction. For the uh, maintained references, we actually see a pattern that looks pretty good. Everybody is mostly using Sierra and Afra. Um, and this is also where you know, the least marking material is expected and everybody is doing that. For the reintroduced references, we're again seeing the similar pattern where most people are, do, are using the same thing the most. And in this case, it's Sierra and Afra. But what we're also seeing is that there's some amount of variability where, again, Martin is using uh, a large amount of classifiers. The native signers don't really use classifiers to reintroduce for these stories. Um, Cody is using, again, mostly nouns, but a lot of classifiers also with proportion nouns. <laughs> All right. Looking at the spatial modulation, that's perhaps the most striking result. So remember that. Uh, Prior research has shown that the late learners struggle with morphosyntax, and that's in fact what we found here too. Um, even though these were very, very simple stories that you saw, um, the native scientists tended to use any type of spatial marking quite a lot, both for maintained and for reintroduced references. So it's about 60% that they do that. So more than half the times when they have the chance to do so, they do so. But Shauna, and Cody and Martin never used any spatial modulation at all. So no morphous and package marking um, on, in their stories at all. Um, Maya and Carlos were the only ones who did. And Maya was the only one who used that for reintroduction. Carlos, Carlos only used it for uh, the maintained references. All right. So are, there, uh, are these narratives then resilient to the age of acquisition effects as prior research has shown? Um, in terms of story events, it actually looks like um, these, these uh, signers are doing pretty well. They're including most of the events, which might suggest that their prag pragmatic awareness, their life experience has actually given them something to work with that makes them perform quite well. Um, however, when we look at how they introduce and uh, reintroduce reference, what we see is that they use really, really underspecified uh, means to introduce references, reference for the first time. And we see a lot of variability when they reintroduce um, reference. So um, those things are remarkable and suggest that um, to me that at least when you're um, much older, when you start learning your first language, this domain of narrative is not resilient to these age of acquisition effects. Um, we also see, of course, as I mentioned, the spatial marking. It is really not used to any degree that's comparable with what the native designers do in these, uh, even though we know that simple uh, <clears throat> simple uh, morphological marking le late learners like this can master and have been shown in other studies to do, but in the context of a narrative, um, we're not seeing them do that. And what this suggests is really that when they get to tell more complex stories, this will be something that will come in handy and help you keep track of things. Um, and they will not be able to do that, we think, based on these results. So um, we're seeing variability also. So some people are doing quite well and others doing quite poorly among this group of five. And this is sort of um, confirming what has been shown before, that once you start learning language late, there's a really a large amount of variability in what the outcome is going to be, even though typically um, we don't see people performing um, like learners who learn. So, um, this suggests to me that the consequences of language deprivation extend across all, all the domains of language, including narrative. So now we come to tie back this question of this case study to the beginning of the talk. So is it reasonable to compare these late learners to people who've learned from birth? I told you before that it's only about 5% of people who can even be considered natives, native signers by most standards. So is it really the best 
comparison to compare them to uh, the late learners to the people who've been learning from birth, given those uh, demographics. Um, on the one hand, I think that it is really problematic that we're thinking about nativeness sort of in this uncritical way and excluding people for reasons that we perhaps haven't examined. Um, and especially it's problematic when we have a community where most people don't fall into that group. We don't know anything about their language use. We don't know how it compares to the native signers and we don't know whether it matters in different contexts. On the other hand, as I hope I've shown you, what we really, really don't want is for people to be deprived of language. And for that to change, we need to have norms to hold against to show people, look, these people have learned to sign, but they learned too late and they will never learn to be as fully competent as other people who have learned from birth. Um, so <laughs> what are the next steps that we have to take to remedy this situation? Um, I think we have to work towards eliminating language deprivation. And I think probably everybody agrees on that. It's just, we probably don't agree on how to do it. Um, I think a good way would be to approve access to sign language for deaf children. And I, I hope I'm preaching to the choir. I have talked to some of you who are maybe interested in becoming SLPs. I think one of the things that's really, really important is that we continue to educate medical professionals about sign language bilingualism, that this can happen, that this is perfectly normal, and that there's a deaf community out there that uses sign language and it's a perfectly valid way of communicating. Um, <clears throat> I also think that we should at the same time be working with the situation that we have and try to increase our understanding of what the variability looks like in the signing community and where it matters and where it doesn't. And that means including signers with different ages of acquisition in our research, which we haven't done a good job of in the sign language research community so far. And then finally, to really critically examine what it means when we say the native signer. And so if anybody is interested in uh, thinking more about these issues, we welcome you <laughs> to the Roll Collective. Um, and in fact, we're having our first symposium, which is going to be virtual. Uh, it's going to happen in April. And it's free to attend. And if you're at all interested, we'd love to see you there. So I should uh, thank all the participating signers and the research assistant that have helped my hat track and Matt, Matthew Sanson in particular, and uh, support from the NIH that we got for this project. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a question. Question. I think this is very by when you describe those late learners, right? Why are they exposed to the um, As far as we can tell, not in any way they're stuck. Um, so their schooling was really, really limited. Um, several of them immigrated from elsewhere, and as far as we can tell, weren't sent to any school because the parents knew they were there and they didn't, the school wasn't equipped to handle that. Um, so as far as we know, it's not completely healthy. And do you have the information about the spoken language, the use of spoken languages? Um, so so again, we <laughs> difficult to get the information from these participants, right? Because they were learning ASL as we were getting to know them. Um, so we have interviews with the people who they were living with and um, to the extent possible their parents. Um, so as far as we know, none of them have used spoken language ever. Um, if you're asking about which spoken languages they were uh, exposed to, um, I don't remember Cody, but Carlos and Martin and Maya were all in uh, communities of spoken Spanish. Um, I think Cody actually English and Sean probably also. So I guess it's all up so I understand that the way they write the language, but can people around them but could speak in Spanish, you know, sometimes need reading part of the condition, right? So Spanish has more of all the language that you did you find any correlation between how to see about the one person that we did like spoke somehow to Spanish as opposed to we didn't look because there was there was just no um, no indication that they had known anything. Um, it might it might be interesting to do this too, um, but I I suspect that things like um, 
you know, the morphology is, is probably too complex to be picked up by your painting alone. Um, but with an analysis of the view. Sure. Um, really just out of curiosity. So you're talking to you compared to groups, um, language with vision and native learners. Um, I can imagine a third group of people who first spoken language was whatever their native language is and then lost their hearing and then deciding at the later mm. age. Do they look more like where do they fall? Yeah. So that's a that's a good question. So um if you if you have essentially the spoken language established before you use your hearing, um the most of the research suggests that um, it it matters that you have language from early on, not which one it is. So even even in terms of brain research, um, the second language learners look more like the native signers, um, even though they were learning late. But as long as they had a language, it's sort of the language pathways got activated, and then new even new languages got put there. Um, so that said, second language learners also do strange things in terms of rapid tracking. So they will do things like be over explicit. So they usually don't go under, but they go over, right? So they keep keep saying the woman or the one woman or the other woman. Um, because they don't take the role, like they don't use the language so, in the same way. Um, so uh, I think I'm the only one who's done research on this for ASL. Um, my findings actually show that they look, the second language learners look pretty much like uh, like the native scientists do. They're a little bit over explicit in how they use classifiers, so they use them a little bit too much. Um, but um, the spoken language research suggests that um, it's things like um, pronouns that they don't use. They, they will use pronoun phrases instead of pronouns. Um, and that's the case even, even for, um, for languages. It's so interesting. Languages that have prograt, even when you are, like if you are, you're, both of your languages have prograt, you still don't use prograt as well in your second language, strangely enough. Um, so um, that's sort of the, the overview. So the idea is that they, these people don't look like second language learners as far as they can. Yeah. Say how you uh, wasn't clear on like the definition of reproduced. Oh yeah. And yes. Maintained. Yeah. Is it just like distance and quality? Uh, no, we use a quite specific definition. So introduced was any first mention of uh, of sure. any entity. And then uh, for maintained, we looked at um, only uh, immediate mentions after an introduction where nothing, no other entity had been mentioned before or in between the introduction and the next time you mentioned that same thing. Um, and we only look at uh, occurrences for maintained and reintroduced only subject position. So, I'm sorry, I just didn't forget it. So maintained was when there was no other entity introduced in between the yeah. two mentions and, the, and reintroduced. It's things. when there, there was nothing else. Yeah. Anything. One. Any other thing, so the popsicle or the balloon man, or whatever. And only one instance is enough. No, that could, could have could have been right. one only instance one enough. Is enough. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, like, if you expect to see the same kind of um, patterns in like more spontaneous interaction, mm -hmm. if you're interested in looking at that, since it's just like narrative task, like I get the idea. But mm -hmm. We also know that, like, in spoken interaction, like that people use. Full noun phrases and subsequent mentions of a um, of a reference, or you know, in a, in a marked way, but like for a specific purpose, right? So yes, they do, and right for specific purposes, like if they perceive something to be like a, a boundary, like a boundary between scenes or episodes. That's actually well, I don't know about narratives, but in conversation, like there are socially meaningful actions that, like using a full noun phrase, yes. does that yes, um, like, don't expect anyway. So. Right. So my feeling is that. Um, oh, so you're thinking because they're being, they are not using noun phrases to introduce entities when they're doing the narratives, would they do so more in a different type of context where, you know, you might expect the, the overall use of noun phrases but to be higher? You see more noun phrases in conversation in re uh, sorry, in uh, maintenance or so-called maintenance or in reintroduction to speak. Because of the right, but possibility if, of doing that. Right, but that would then imply that the nations would be even worse <laughs> because they're, they're good at using zero and abrupt. They're not so good at using noun phrases in the right spots. 
So if if everybody else, if the comparison is more noun phrases, then they should be worse. That said, I think there is something being said for other types of non-narrative. There is something about this narrative. You have to do a multitude of things. Like you have to keep track of the story structure, yeah, who did right. I mention now? And I think when you're talking about, when you're not having the cognitive load of having to also tell the story, um, that you're probably going to do better. So I guess I'd ask a question too. I was just wondering, like, why all of the zero and after the initial mentions and the late learners? Um, do they, yeah. I, I don't know. And if you looked at that in sort of ordinary interaction, would you see the same? Would you see the same number of like zero and after initial mentions? Uh, no, my feeling is not among native sites. In all the work I've done and the, the literature I've seen, there's no indication that that's that that's typical. That said, it's not typical and spoken language either in conversation to use zero and after initially. No, it's odd. So I'm wondering what is that all about? Yeah, I, I, so um, perfect sign language apparently, uh, even native signers tend to introduce, introduce more with zero and after than you expect. Um, so I, I think that there one possibility for Shauna especially is that she didn't understand the text. I, I haven't been able to rule that out. Maybe she just thought, you know. What is this like? Why are they showing me these things? Like she's like, yeah, it fell, you know. Yeah, I was thinking like everybody like there's only one video. Everybody knows who you're referring to. You know, it's not the world where there's millions of references. Uh, yeah. So there, but there were four videos, and each of them she did. But but if you start the task is you know what happened here, the thing fell, you know, then you sort of start from the thing that happened. The beginning is just sort of, eh, you know. Um, so I, I haven't been able to rule that out. It's possible that she just did not understand it. Um, that doesn't say so much about her narrative, but it does say something about her language comprehension. Um, so um, more work to be determined. Yeah, quick uh, comment on the graphing track. Yes. So if we're talking about four NPs, four nouns, so they are referring expressions. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're very specific, very conspicuous. Yes. So it should be much easier for tracking. But for pronouns, so they had to retrieve their antecedents. Mm -hmm. So it will be a little bit more difficult. Yes. But for zero or empty categories, it will be the most difficult because they, they have to be tracked. Without any context. information. So it takes longer. Uh, for the learner to recover it. Now I have, a, I know you have the most to say about American Sign Language. I'm, I know nothing about it. Okay. So it's very interesting now that you have raised two important issues. One is about the access or partial access or no access to the language input. Mm -hmm. So most of your participants, they start learning the sign language much later. Mm -hmm. So they have rather limited or even no access uh, to the input. So it is caused by the language environment because they, uh, they, they are deaf. Okay. So I'm thinking about another issue in secondary language acquisition you mentioned in, in, in the beginning. Okay. So in secondary language acquisition, we have the notion of the critical period hypothesis. So some children, if they start learning a second language within the critical period, so the nativeness, or at least the native-like proficiency, is still achievable. But I'm wondering why not for deaf children? So, so X is the one thing. Do we think age and, and the access are related? Because for, for second language, children have four access to natural language. Mm. But not for their kids. Yeah. 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 I think um, some of the brain research that I know about suggests that it, it's really um, the critical period for second, second language acquisition is much more difficult to sort of get a handle on, right? Because some people perform actually really well and vocabulary acquisition seems to be not effective. There's all sorts of things going on. For this, it does seem to be the case that if you don't have those initial years, if there's no access to any type of language, that it just, in the brain, the, the 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 language doesn't end up sitting in the same spots, right? So some of these people have been um, been included in multiple studies, and I think it's 
for Shauna, for example, um, that she processes images, like visual images, in where you would typically see language happen. And so um, there are all sorts of things that seem to happen when, when you don't have access. I do think um, I do think age matters, um, right? But it's it's really hard to tease that apart from um, you know, from the biological constraints that may be involved, right? Because we can't have people where we sort of reset the clock on their brains when they're older and see what happens. Um, so I, I, we probably won't be able to tease that apart very easily. Um, I, I would be surprised if it doesn't matter. So one of the things that I, you know, I keep thinking about is, you know, research on um, home signs or people who are deaf but sort of get by, you know, exist in their hearing communities anyway. And they sort of tell these elaborate stories just using pantomime and everybody enjoys it and they're clearly coherent stories. If that's possible without any language at all, right? Well, why can't these people who get access to a language learn how to do it? And I, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure that they all can. Like if I look at Maya's performance, she looks almost exactly like a native signer on most of these measures. So it's not, you know, it's not that it's entirely impossible, I guess, um, at least not on a task as this one, but it's just across the board when we're measuring things that it's, it seems like they just don't get there. So, so the, 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 the issue here is that why it becomes so difficult or even impossible for late signers to recover yeah. their language acquisition. Yeah. So that's the issue. Yeah, it's yeah, it simply seems like that early experience with not language you just can't recover from at least not fully. I'm just curious if any of the late learners used more gestures in a non um a systematic way and non I'm not talking about particular action actually as part of sign language, but as a way to try to compensate for lack of memory to say that. Right. So in these stories, we we didn't actually find gestures really. They were just sort of to the point and they they just sort of addressed um the few things that were happening in the stories. Um so I'm I'm speaking, I think, anecdotally, but it is my impression of other uh more informal tasks I've seen that some of them will use more more gesturing, almost like pantomime, um, to get their point across. And um, which is actually interesting because some of that comes out as uh as classifier use. Right, so things like uh, you know showing that you pour something or, or whatever that that comes out as looking like classifier verb, which is a typically difficult thing in sign language. The children don't ma uh, master these until much later in their development, but it's also the way you would show it with pantomime, right? So it does seem that there's some kind of um, transfer or facilitation of sort of being expressive using those types of things. Um, and it does seem that that varies a little bit by sign or perhaps personality, like how much outgoing are you while willing to just go there. Um, but that's, I, I'm speaking and don't think so. What I really love about this research too is it's showing people that, you know, don't necessarily, that aren't necessarily immersed in the community, the science behind the importance of learning sign language at an early age. Um, because, you know, me being somebody that has a background in sign language that loves it, has always stressed early intervention in, you know, a cultural way when it comes to deafness. Like, you know, a deaf child who majority of the time has hearing parents, they need to be in their community. They need to be immersed in their community and have a community. But I never really, like, stress the importance of, like, the science behind it, the science mm -hmm. behind, you know, mm -hmm. you reach a point in your language learning and that's it. And that's sad, that's scary. And that is something that can very well commonly happen in the deaf children. And I should note that actually Carlos and Cody and Shauna, when when it was when so uh when they were discovered, as it were, um, they came here or they were addressed by um seen by you know different types of professionals. Um, they were placed together in a group home where the staff only used ASL and they were deaf native signers signing with them. So one, it's actually possible that these people are overperforming what you might otherwise find because they actually got immersed uh, later on. Yeah. So they actually had a very good environment in which to learn yeah. once they had access, but it, it just shows the importance of all the stuff that came before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm probably biased, but it makes me think of a uh, theory of mind kind of tests. 
and the way they are tested. And I know it's also uh, a big chunk of um, signing literature and the ability to perform theory of mind testing. And recent studies show that memory constraints and syntactic constraints affect performance on theory of mind tests. In all your narratives, there were at least two people. So there was the main entity, mm -hmm. and then there was the entity that gave them. Mm -hmm. Did you try to reduce to one person going, getting something, dropping something? And we didn't, but it's a great idea. Um, okay. And second part? Yeah. Squeeze it in really quick. Do you have data for these five people on performance of theory of mind? Uh, that one I can answer. Uh, we do not. And I think I think we have, for most of them, we have uh, cognitive, different types of cognitive tasks. But again, um, many of this is really hard to do when they don't have enough language to actually do the test. Um, so as far as we know, cognitively, like IQ-wise, they, they are OK. Um, but we, we don't have theory of mind as far as I know. Um, but I, I wanted to mention that your first point, which was that um, they actually, many of the scientists actually self-simplified the story. So they left out the meeting. They just said there was a person and they got an object and then they dropped it, right? Um, so um, yes, that is, I think that's a good suggestion to make it even simpler. I swear when I designed these, I thought I was going to go crazy because they were so simple as they were. Um, but you are absolutely right. When we're seeing these results, what we want to do is take it back and I'll step and see. How that, how what that so there's a paper called how to test the um how to test the false belief test before your third birthday. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So they had a simplified version that you act part of it, and then suddenly three year olds test the false belief test um, because it was simplified. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if it's about perspective taking, too many perspective and having to verbalize it into a narrative. I think it is. I think it is. I think it's a combination because all you know, most of the evidence point to like the simple structures and the simple vocabulary that you would need to tell a story like this, it should actually be able to do. Um so that it's, you know, um that is the sort of combination of doing it in this context and having the additional burden of actually having to tell the story and do it in a context that's maybe not familiar to you, that all of these things may contribute. Um, because there's also work showing that, um, the, not just the evidence, but others, that if they get to tell the same story over and over, several times, like over a time period, not even really, like over different weeks, that they'll they'll do better. Um, so there's that. Uh, is there a hand down there or something? Okay. Just a quick clarification. Uh, so they were in, so some of them have been in Spanish speaking, English speaking communities. Have they, to some extent, acquired those languages? And stuff? No. So they, um, they, okay. All right. Yeah. I, as far as we know, no. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and take the, we're, you're welcome to still can take questions because we have so many of them, but you're welcome to grab snacks and anyone who has another appointment. I'm going to go ahead and close the laptop. There was, there was nothing else on Zoom, right? Okay, perfect. But go ahead, Jean. I, I'm just curious um, how they be understood by each other. Right now, they're so. That's a good question. 